the privilege to come to you and ask and to praise and to request and Lord, I, I really don't know where to begin I don't know what your will is uh, about people's health I'm, I'm praying that it would be your will to put people back on the road to health again if that's not your will I pray that you would just give us grace to accept your perfect will in each of these situations Thank you for your goodness to us. Bless us as we study. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we are in chapter 13 of the book of Proverbs. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, nobody succeeds alone. Uh, Lefty Gomez, I don't know if any of y'all have ever heard of Lefty Gomez, but he was a um, professional baseball player, and he was a pitcher, as a matter of fact. And he was asked the secret of his incredible world record series, which was 6-0. and oh. And uh, here's what Lefty Gomez said. Clean living and a fast outfield. That was, that was his statement. Uh, nobody succeeds by himself or herself. I mean, we all have a team of people. And whether it's an official team or not, really doesn't matter. But children uh, do not become wise by themselves. Children need guidance. We all had it. There was someone in our lives, probably parents, or friend, or maybe a pastor, or a school teacher, or something, but somebody has already done what you want to do. Someone has already accomplished what you want to accomplish, and somebody helped them, just like somebody is, is helping us, and somebody's already been there. So they have, they have faced the obstacles, they have faced the problems, and I think it's good for us to listen to, now here's what's going to happen. You know, you're going to run into this and this and this. And if, if they have successfully navigated through those things, I think it really, really is a good idea for us to listen. So look at verse number 1 in chapter 13. We're going to look at a couple of words because just words are so important. And to be honest with you, there are some words, there's language in King James that doesn't really clearly tell you what that verse is saying from the original language. No translation does that. I'll look at verse number one. A wise son heareth his father's instruction, but a scorner heareth not rebuke. All right, let me give you the meaning of this, and then we'll look at, at the words. Number one, listen to the right people. Listen to the right people. All right, now go back to verse number one. A wise son heareth. Now we think, oh, that's he's listening. He's just hearing. But when you step into the Hebrew, it means is or reflects. All right, let me read it that way. A wise son is his father's instruction. Does that make sense? A wise son reflects his father's instruction. In other words, the, the son is what the daddy says you should be. He becomes that. That's a wise young man. But a scorner heareth not rebuke. And so... Uh, Paul talks about this matter of how children are to respond to the parents, and he says that they are to do two things. Number one, obey. And the word obey means to bend in the direction of. Uh, so if, uh, if the wind is coming out of the east, what direction is the tree going to bend? To the west. All right? It's going to bend with the wind. And so Paul says, children, bend in the direction of your parents' counsel. That is the most important thing they'll ever hear. And then he says, not only obey, but honor. Honor your mother and your father, for this is right. And the word honor means to make heavy. So it's like you take an empty sandbag, fill it with sand. You've just made that sandbag heavy. So what is the heaviest thing a child should be able to hear in the course of his growing up years? Counsel of his mom and dad. Now, unfortunately, that's not always the case, but that should be the case. Um, and so there are four things when we're dealing with kids, there are four things that, of course, we, all of our kids are raised now, just they're gone, but we've got grandkids, you know, that quite possibly even parents. But here's number one, teach him to make his own decisions. Don't make every decision for a kid, because if every decision is made for that child, then when he leaves home, what's he going to do? And he goes to college, or he gets married, or he moves off and gets a job somewhere, He's going to be calling you, well, I've got this, what, what should I do here? Teach him to make his own decisions. Number two, let him wreck when he dishonors your counsel. Let him, let him hit the wall. 
uh, you, you know, you've told him and you've told him or you've counseled her and you've told her and told her and told her and told her. And then when it blows up, don't run in and rescue them. I mean, unless it's, you know, like a life-threatening situation. But let them feel the sting of their own ignorance. Because there's nothing quite like that. So maybe, maybe next time, I won't do that. All right, then number three, never break his spirit, capture his will. Don't ever break the child's spirit. If you do that, you're going to have an emotional cripple on your hands. But you want to capture their will. You want them to want to obey you. And you don't do that by just demanding it, all right? You will do what I tell you to do. Well, you can do that, but as soon as they get out from under the sound of your voice, guess what they're going to do? Whatever they want to do, all right? And then number four, teach them to want to obey you because of your love for them. They don't want to break mom and dad's heart. No, I'm not going to do that. That'd break my mother's heart. And if the love relationship is right, that will be a barrier to that kid. No, you know, my mom and dad have, no, all right? So truth this is the truth about about listening so listen to the right people all right look at uh, verses two and three <clears throat> a man shall eat good by the fruit of his mouth and he's talking about his words here but the soul of the transgressors shall eat violence he that keepeth his mouth keepeth or guards his life but he that openeth wide his lips shall have destruction and that phrase, openeth wide, means talks too much. Um, so, verses 2 and 3, your harvest is the product of your words. The word good means what is pleasant to taste or smell. The word violence means crude or unripe. So, your words, there you go, your words are the vehicle to your future. And, you know, we constantly talk about what we've been thinking about. You get around some people, and all they talk about is football. Well, guess what they've been thinking about all day long? You know, football. Uh, people talk about their cars. Well, that's what they've been doing. People talk about what they think about. And what has consumed your thinking will also direct your actions. And uh, so your actions are going to create your destiny in, uh, in life. All right? Look at verse number four. Somebody said one time, never miss a good opportunity to shut up. Uh, and I think that's probably some pretty good advice right there. Um, there was a, this is back many, many, many years ago. There was uh, a fellow member of parliament during Winston Churchill's uh, tenure as their prime minister. And her name was Bessie Braddock. And I don't know if she's any kin to you or not, but her name was Bessie Braddock. And she, uh, she said to Churchill one day, Churchill wasn't the easiest person to get along with. Yeah, I'm, I'm aware of that. But she said this, Sir, you are drunk. And Churchill replied, Madam, you are ugly. However, in the morning, I shall be sober. <laughs> All right, so a, a, good, a good command of the English language can open doors for you. All right, look at verse 4. The soul of the sluggard desireth. Now, what does sluggard mean? What's a sluggard? Lazy guy, yeah. This, this guy won't do anything. The soul of the sluggard desireth and hath nothing. But the soul of the diligent, and that means sharp or incisive, shall be made fat. Verse number Four teaches the dreamer lacks, the diligent lives. The dreamer lacks, but the diligent lives. The, the truth about laziness, uh, it'll make you poor. You know, laziness will just, will just kill you in every kind of way. And laziness is silent defiance. Uh, you don't have to say anything, you know, to be lazy. And, and children can be just pure lazy, and that, that can be a, a sign of their silent defiance. And, and wishful thinking is useless unless you put your life in gear, you know, and get some things done. And it's, it's not easy to reach your goals. It takes grit, determination, and work, and effort, and all those kinds of things. And it's, um, it's pretty exhaustive to be successful. We've got some successful people in here. Um, Betty, you guys had... 
what this big packing plant, right? Did you do a little bit of work in that? Quite a bit of work, all right? Very successful. <laughs> so we've got successful people. Y'all been successful. Y'all been successful, and, and uh, it, just, it just takes a lot of work. Um, yeah, Erwin Lutzer said this, former pastor of uh, Moody Church and, and president, I think, of, of Moody College. He said this, quote, better to love God and die unknown than to love the world and be a hero. Better to be content with poverty than to die a slave to wealth. Better to have taken some risks and lost than to have done nothing and succeeded at it. Better to have lost some battles than to have retreated from the war. Better to have failed when serving God than to have succeeded when serving the kingdom of darkness. What a tragedy to climb the ladder of success only to discover that the ladder was leaning against the wrong wall. Pretty, pretty good right there. So sow nothing, reap nothing. That's just that's the law of the harvest. So um, be prepared, and this shouldn't be this way, but it is. Be prepared for backlash from people when you succeed because not everybody cares enough to succeed. And when you succeed, they're going to be a little jealous of that, and they may just come against you. Oscar Wilde said, There's always something about your success that displeases even your best friends. And he's probably got a point there. Look at verse number five. A righteous man hateth lying, but a wicked man is loathsome and cometh to shame. And the word shame means to cause a stink. Uh, you're riding down the road. Can you tell when somebody run over a skunk? You might not even see him, but you know he's somewhere, and that's, that stink will stay in your car for several miles. Um, verse number five teaches that lying, <coughs> lying is unlike God. Lying is unlike God. So that's why the righteous man hates it, is because God doesn't lie. Whatever God doesn't do, we shouldn't do. Whatever God does, we should have a desire to do those things. And so the godly man despises that which violates the nature of the God he loves. And, uh, so, you know, lying is just not part of the nature and the character and the makeup of the Lord. Honesty is a reflection of deity. When a person tells the truth, that is a reflection of the God that we serve because God is a God of honesty. And so it's just, it's the part of the fingerprint of God within man to want to tell the truth. Um, there's a Russian proverb that says, with lies, you may go ahead in the world, but you can never go back. And so loathsomeness is, causes a stink. All right, look at verse number six. Righteousness keepeth, and it's the same word in verse number three, and it means to guard or to protect. So let's read it that way. Uh, righteousness protects him that is upright in the way, but wickedness overthroweth the sinner. Verse number six teaches righteousness is a boundary that defines us. Righteousness is a boundary that defines us. It, it's like a, the riverbed that guides and directs the direction of the water in the right direction. And boundaries are essential. Matter of fact, boundaries define us. Uh, they define what is yours. They define what is mine. Is that important? You got two neighbors that live next door to each other and they own some property? Where's the boundary line? Does it matter? Ah, it doesn't matter. Oh, I'm afraid it does. Uh, when it comes time to pay property tax, does it matter? That when it comes time to mow or plant or even know what your, where your property line ends, it is, it is very, very critical. And uh, so uh, boundaries tell you what you own, what you don't own. And so we're responsible for maintaining our boundary. I am not responsible for mowing my neighbor's yard. Unless he asked me to, then I'd be glad to do it. But, you know, we, we've got a line. There are three phone poles on the south side of our property that define uh, where our property line is, and that's, that's where I stop mowing. And uh, so let me give you some examples of some boundaries. Skin. Skin is a boundary. Keeps good stuff in, bad stuff out. That's, that's the idea of skin. How about words? Are words good boundaries? Words? How about no? Is no a boundary word? Yes is a boundary word. 
Um, so how about truth? Truth is unchangeable. Truth doesn't evolve. I don't care, and Betty mentioned it, our country is just vibrating with wickedness right now because we're trying to change the definition of truth. You know, what is right, what is wrong? Well, that used to be right, then it's still right. If it's a moral issue, it's still right. And I realize that technology changes. There was a time when abacus, that was, boy, that was cutting-edge technology. We had an abacus. Now that's kind of in the museum. So I understand that that kind of stuff changes, but morality does not change. Um, and so you want to create distance. And this, this is going to sound a little odd initially. Create distance between yourself and an ungodly person. Now, can you be friends with an ungodly person? Can you have contact? Yes. How about can you say, you know, your, your rejection of Christianity doesn't matter to me. We can still be as close as we ever were. Is that a wise thing to do? It is not because initially you're going to say, well, you know, maybe he's got a point. And you're going to start sympathizing with his platform. So we need to be careful with that. Uh, look at verse number 8. 7. There is that maketh himself rich. Now this is going to be kind of odd right here. There is that that make, And the word maketh means to pretend. Okay? So there is that that pretends to be rich. But he has nothing. And then there is that guy that pretends to be poor and has great riches. All right? Verse number 7 teaches this. Wealth is having enough of God's provision to fulfill his purpose for your life. That's what wealth is. Um, You ever seen people that didn't have anything that tried to pretend like they did? How, how are some things, what are, what are some ways that you've seen people try to pretend to be something they're not? <laughs> okay. Okay. Nathan? <laughs> yeah, the vehicle is a real, you know, yeah, that, you put all your money in a vehicle, you know, jack it up, and, I've seen, and I want somebody to explain to me putting lights in your wheels where I can see your brake pads. I, can somebody explain that to me? It's what? All right, you know, but you know, people do all kinds of things that they really can't afford to do, but they want you to think they have something that they don't have. And uh, so uh, wealth is having enough of God's provision to fulfill his purpose for your life. Look at verse number eight. The ransom of a man's life are his riches, but the poor heareth not rebuke. Verse number eight, wealth has its disadvantages. Here's what this verse is teaching. Who is in greater danger of being kidnapped? A millionaire or a homeless guy? Now, is anybody going to kidnap a homeless guy and say, all right, somebody better give me a lot of money for this guy, you know? Um... Somebody that is poor is probably not going to get kidnapped. You're, you're pretty safe. But it's the guy that's got all this stuff or the woman that's got all this stuff. And so wealth has its disadvantages. People will attack those for whom they believe they have something I want. And so, again, you know, a man that's living in poverty doesn't have anything that people want. And so he's safe, you know, with regards to that. So money can attract their own kind of attention. Look at verse number 9. The light of the righteous rejoiceth, but the lamp of the wicked shall be put out. All right, verse number 9 teaches the godly burn brightly, the ungodly burn out. 
um, eventually the glitch will wear off of wealth that was gained improperly. And if it was gained illegally or immorally, eventually that's going to come to the surface. You cannot hide that kind of stuff. Um, I'm thinking of some people right here in town in the last 20 years that were pretty wealthy, but they got it the wrong way, you know, stole it out of other people's accounts and, and uh, did, did some things that were wrong, and um, well, it ruined them. You know, there are some folks that are in prison because of that kind of activity, and so it's a wasted opportunity in one's generation to, to gain wealth the wrong way, and that happens all the time. Uh, I think politicians are world famous. Not all of them, thank God. But, uh, you know, these people go to Washington broke, and, you know, 15, 20 years later, they're multi, multi-millionaires, you know, and they don't make all that much money, you know what I'm saying? Salary-wise, anyway. So, um, verse number 10. Only by pride cometh contention, but with the well-advised is wisdom. Verse number 10, people argue to prove themselves right. George Bernard Shaw said, a man never tells you anything until you contradict him. Um, you haven't converted a man because you've silenced him, basically. Some people are just good debaters. And there are some folks, I know some and you know some, doesn't matter what you say, they're going to disagree with you. They're going to they're gonna change it. They're going to say, no, 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 that's not, you know. You know, it was, I don't know, I think it was like in the middle of September. No, no, it was the first week of September. Like that, like it makes a great, big, huge amount of difference. Um, it's about 15 miles. No, it's 19 miles. Okay, 19 miles. They just want to make sure that everybody knows I am the source of everything that is true and right and accurate. And that ticks me off, but that's, some people are that way. So people argue to prove themselves right. And, uh, and, and then on the other side of that coin, there's, there's nothing quite so annoying as arguing with somebody that knows what they're talking about. You know what I'm talking? And, it, and it doesn't take long for you to figure out, uh -oh, okay, okay, I put my foot in my mouth. I just need to stop right now. All right, look at verse number 11. Wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished, but he that gathereth by labor shall increase. Right, verse number 11 teaches you are your own best employee. You are your own best employee. Um, a college graduate was recently asked if he was looking for work, and he thought about it for a minute. He said, well, no, not necessarily, but I would like a job. And I think that's pretty pervasive right now, you know. And I'm, man, I am. I'm here business with people that I can't get people to show up for work after they get their paycheck, you know. And uh, I think the, this new generation that has, has learned to just live off the government or, you know, stay in mama's basement until they're 46 years old. They've, they've not learned what it means to get out and work. Um, an employer told a guy one time, said, I, I'm sorry, I don't have a job for you. And he says, I, I couldn't find enough work to keep you busy. And the guy said, oh, you have no idea how little it takes to keep me busy. <laughs> we may have a job here after all. So uh, I think we just need to be known for an honest day's work, you know. Uh, get your job done. And I respect and appreciate people uh, that, that look for work, and when they get it, they do a good job. Josh, you, you remind me of that guy. Uh, that you know you, you're working hard and you're doing a great job and I, that that speaks volumes for you so I appreciate that all right look at verse number 12 hope deferred and that means drawn out or delayed maketh the heart sick but when the desire comes it's a tree or a source of life all right verse number 12 teaches that goals attained bring great happiness. Have you ever planned to have something or do something and it can't happen for six months? And you're like, oh, man, you know, I thought this was going get, to get done. And um, 
when you have something that you really, really, really want to do and it gets delayed, how does that make you feel? You know, you thought it was going to happen today, and you find out where it won't be for another year. We're, we're still in the process of approving this and all that kind of thing. Oliver Wendell Holmes said, every calling is great when greatly pursued. Um, I, I've, I've told the church this for years. You do one thing better than you do anything else. That's the thing you need to pursue. That's the thing that God has given you the skill to do. And it is, it is my belief that we all have a purpose. God has designed human beings for a purpose. And that purpose is not your decision. It's your discovery. And your purpose involves this, solving problems. Say, so, well, what kind of problem? Now, that I don't know. But it could be, you know, doctors solve medical problems. Dentists solve med uh, dental problems. Uh, engineers solve engineering problems. And so uh, you are designed to solve some kind of problem. And the better you do that, guess what happens when a person solves problems, a particular kind of problem, better than anybody else in that area? Who's going to get all the business? That guy. That's exactly right. That guy. And so the better you do your job, the, the more business you're going to have. And so goals attained bring great happiness all right look at verse number 13 whoso despiseth the word shall be destroyed but he that feareth the commandment shall be rewarded all right, verse number 13 teaches keep your word about the word uh, people who listen to counsel Good, solid, biblical counsel are going somewhere. They're headed in a good direction. Uh, and again, I bet all of us know somebody. They don't listen to anybody. You can, you can tell them. You can encourage them. You can warn them. You can whatever. And they're like, yeah, 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 whatever. And then they go off, and then when it blows up, they come back with powder burns on their face. Um... You know, they, they wish they had listened. Did your parents ever tell you something that you ignored that later on you wished you hadn't ignored? Or have you forgotten about those? Mm -hmm. Betty, were you a good girl? Oh, wow. Raising kids ain't fun. You're right about that. <laughs> now, back in the day, that was a very real fear right there. Um, that you know, Keep your word about the word. And what I mean by that is the guy that rejects sound counsel, um, he's headed for a, a train wreck. And you know it. You can see it. But I mean, what are you going to do? I mean, this, this kid, it's just like a, a cow that continually gets, gets through the fence constantly. And, and there's a highway nearby. Put him back in, he gets back out. Put him back in, he gets back. Put him back. What do you know is going to happen one day? You know he's going to get hit with a, with a phosphate truck or, you know, uh, something. A smart car. And, <laughs> and of course, he... This, yeah, he could just walk back to the fence if he gets hit by a smart car. Yeah, smart car won't, won't bother him. But um, keep your word about the word. Right, look at verse number 14. The law of the wise is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. Verse number 14 teaches be a source of light or truth and direction. Andrew Jackson said one time, one man with courage is a majority. And I love that mentality. Uh, every conversation and every day can be a classroom. And I think the, the greatest school that a kid can ever attend is home. It's the house. And I completely disagree with Hillary Clinton on so many things. But a number of years ago, that woman said, it takes a village to raise a child. First time I heard that, I was like, 
You, you idiot. No, it takes, it takes a, yeah, it takes godly parents to raise a child. I don't, you know, I don't need the school trying to, to rearrange the morals that I have from a biblical standpoint taught my children. And which basically that's what, you know, the educational system in the country has just turned into this social laboratory where they are trying to readjust, you know, the morals taught by good families. And uh, so, you know, I, I need to be very, very aware that we're a fountain and somebody is drinking from your counsel, from your wisdom, uh, from from the direction that, that you're giving. All right, look at verse number 15. Verse 4, yes. Be a source of light and direction. Everybody up? Okay, look at verse 15. Good understanding, and that just simply means sense. So this is common sense, all right? Common sense giveth favor. But the way of transgressors is hard. Verse number 15. The wise gain God's favor. The Lord will finance the kindness and the forgiveness and the wisdom and the grace and the faithfulness of the person who embraces truth from Scripture. He will he'll finance your life. And I'm looking at people that you've experienced that on a personal level. Um, he will put this person in front of people who can bless them who can give them favor in areas of their life that, that they need some help in. And he provides access to influence to people who honor the Lord. And so life without the Lord, would you agree that it's a treacherous ordeal at best, you know, without the Lord? And so your godliness is your protection. That That is the protection. All right, look at verse number 16. Every prudent man dealeth with knowledge but a fool layeth open his folly and that phrase layeth open means displays it's like the idiot says hey y'all look how dumb I am you know and they just do stupid stuff over and over and they're proud of it they're proud of it you know it's, it's like the, the idiot hey hold my beer uh, eventually it's, it's going to get real serious with this guy but verse number 16, fools have no filter. Proverbs 12, 15 says, The way of a fool is right in his own eyes. Fools don't know it. You know what I'm saying? They, they think they're cute. They think they are all that. But they're dumb and they don't know it. They're, they're unaware of what is around the corner for them. And Charles Lamb said one time, here cometh April again, and as far as I can see, the world has more fools in it than ever. Um, a, a fool has no problem displaying his foolishness. And you can tell, I mean, out on the playground, there are going to be certain kids on the playground. They're going to be bullies. They're going to make fun of people, you know. Uh, and I when I, my generation, if you wore glasses, you got picked on. You, know, you were called four eyes and called all kind of names. And if you had braces back in the day, we didn't have Invisalign back in those days. We had these big old metal braces, you know, a little like hog wire. Oh, and oh my goodness, we just, it was, uh-huh. It was just all kinds of stuff uh, that, that they were called. And so fools have no filter. Everything comes through every time are there things you think that you don't say should there be things we think that we don't say uh yeah yeah the many <laughs> oh my goodness <laughs> but there are people that talk just so they can hear the sound of their own voice you know they're they're just impressed with with the resonance and uh so the purpose of their speaking is just to to just build a stage you know for themselves 
Yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. I do not listen to the radio program. Yeah, exactly. Right? Exactly right. You know, you're when I'm recording, you know, I'm like, oh, this, this is going. And then when I, I, I have listened to it, uh, but it's like, oh, oh, no. Let me just turn it off. All right. Look at verse number 17. Verse 17. A wicked messenger falleth into mischief, but a faithful ambassador is health. All right. Verse number 17 teaches, be a trustworthy steward of entrusted information. Be a trustworthy steward of entrusted information. There's, this is a true story. It was about the Earl of Essex during uh, one of uh, Queen Elizabeth's favorite, favorite men in court. And one day, Queen Elizabeth gave this Earl a ring, her personal ring. And it was a pledge of her affection, and she told him that if he ever was accused of a crime or got in some serious legal trouble, send her that ring. And when she got that ring, boogity boogity, she'd be over to help him. And um, so there was a, a point when this guy got arrested for something. And apparently, he, he really was not guilty. And the queen waited and waited and waited for the ring to come. Never came. The guy was executed. Years later, the Countess of Nottingham was a relative, but not a friend of this Earl of Essex. She didn't like this guy at all. And she sent a messenger to Queen Elizabeth and said, I need to talk to you. And she says, I have a confession, and I need to ask your forgiveness for what I did. And Elizabeth goes to the bed of this dying woman, and she produced the ring. She said, the Earl of Essex gave this to me many years ago to give to you. I didn't like him, and I didn't give it to you. So they executed the guy. And here's what Queen Elizabeth did. She screamed. She grabbed the woman by her nightgown, and she screamed this. God may forgive you, but I never shall. Um, be a trustworthy steward of entrusted information. Um, when, when people counsel with you, it needs to stay confidential. Uh, tell people, when I counsel with people, First thing I tell them is, whatever you say to me is confidential, unless you give me permission to, you know, share it with anybody. But people don't come in there for me to vomit their problems out all over the place. And so uh, I'm sure that people have come to you, hey, can I talk to you? And don't say anything to anybody. Well, don't. Don't say anything to anybody. All right, look at verse number 18. Poverty, well, that's financial poverty. Shame, that's social disapproval shall be to him that refuseth instruction. But he that regardeth reproof shall be honored. Verse number 18, listen to those who have done what you desire to do. Listen to those who have done what you desire to do. We're counseled to success by mentors, people that have done what you want to do. If you wanted to, for instance, learn how to be a, an excellent basketball player, who might be someone you'd check in with? Vance would be a good one. Uh, Michael Jordan, yeah. I wouldn't spend 10 minutes with LeBron James, but Michael Jordan's the best I've ever seen play the game. And, and so just listen to those who, who uh, have done what you desire to do. Right, look at verse number 19. The desire accomplished is sweet to the soul, but it is abomination to fools to depart from evil. Right, verse number 19 teaches we embrace what brings us happiness. We embrace what brings us happiness. One man plans and works and accomplishes his goals in life, and it's good to him. And the fool is so connected to his wickedness that it seems wrong to disconnect from it. He's been dumb for so long, he thinks it's the only way to live life. And so this is why a lot of people don't get saved. And I've had people tell me, uh, man, I'd have to give this up. I'd have to quit doing that. I'd have to, you know, and I'm like, 
you realize what you're saying, right? Uh, you're willing to go to hell to, to keep doing this, but some people are, are that way. And uh, so we embrace what brings us happiness. Look at verse number 20. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise. But a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Verse number 20 teaches the worth of a relationship can be measured by its contribution to your priorities. Who are your friends? What are their goals in life? I mean, are they walking in harmony with, with the Lord? Do they honor the church? You know? Do they... Speak truth, do they do the right thing? Do they treat people with kindness? And so, uh, and again, I'm talking to the choir here. Y'all know, pick your companions and your friends very carefully because they will bring their stink with them, whatever stink they might have. Look at verse number 21. Evil pursueth or chases after sinners, but to the righteous good shall be repaid. Uh, verse number 21 teaches you attract what you respect. Now, this is, this is telling me a sinner doesn't have to look for problems. Problems are looking for him, and they'll find it. They'll track you down. Um, people create their own atmosphere in life. And the things in life that I lionize or despise are going to be attracted to me. And I don't know exactly how this works, but it's called the law of attraction. What you talk about, what you, what you respect is what finds you. Uh, it's, just, it's just the thing that, that you honor is going to be all over you. And so you attract what you respect. Uh, if you, for instance... You, you deer hunt. Uh, how, how, what's one of the ways you can attract a buck to your stand or your area? Kind of gross, but it works. Oh, well, I wasn't thinking that far. Uh, <laughs> you've done that? Oh, okay. All right. Man, uh, yeah, you can. It's called a doe drip. You can get these little things and hang it in a tree, and it's dripping doe pee, okay? And, oh, yeah. <laughs> but you don't stand under it, you know what I'm saying? I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that, but that old book, do what? It really stinks. It, and, man... I'm almost afraid to eat the meat off of something that's attracted to that. But anyway, that's the way it is. Um, so you remember what Job said? Job said uh, one of the most amazing things. That thing which I greatly feared hath come upon me. And I've often thought about that. Man, what did he fear? Losing his kids, losing his money. Uh, God took everything but his wife. And it, it was just, wow, life just collapsed. That was the thing he was afraid of. All right, look at verse 22. A good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children. And the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. Now, this is one of those statements that sounds like something, it's saying something that it's not. Children's children. Who in English, who is that? It's your grandkids. All right, now, is he telling you, don't give your kids anything? Leave it for your grand. No, this is, it is a general statement for family. Okay, so... Verse number 22, leave your legacy to your family. Leave your legacy to your family. Um, this lack, a lot of people don't have inheritance, and I think it's a good thing to leave what you have, leave something to your family. Uh, and that's what, that's what we're talking about here. All right, let's look at um, verse number 23. Verse 23, much food is in the tillage of the poor. Now, the word tillage, we don't use that word today. It means barren field or unplowed field. It's, it's a part of their property that they are not agriculturally active in. 
Much food's in the tillage of the poor. But there is that is destroyed for want of judgment. Now, verse number 23 teaches the working man's a nation builder. But it also, there's a secondary meaning here that poor people are often taken advantage of by the wealthy. You know, their properties are stolen. Um, I, I'm, I'm seeing now, I think the IRS is nothing more than legal thievery in a lot of, you know, and I, I'm, we pay taxes. We render to Caesar because I, I think that's the right thing to do. If our house catches on fire, I want the fire department to show up, you know. And, and so y'all understand that. But I do despise this wealth distribution idea. Let's steal from people who make it or tax, the, you know, and, and give it to people that won't work. I hate that. I just, I despise that very idea. Um, but anyway, all right, look at verse number 24. He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. And the word betimes means at the appropriate time. All right? it, it doesn't mean, oh, it's time for a beating. Get in here. You know, it's, that's not what we're talking about. Uh, but verse number 24, correction is an expression of love. Now, you tell that to the average parent today or school board or, you know what I'm saying? Uh, love cares what a child does. You know, love cares where a child goes. Love cares who a child makes friends with. Love cares about that. Um, love is not oppressive. It's not cruel. It's involved. And so, you know, love doesn't breathe for the child. You can't do that. You know, you can't make every decision and, and follow them around all of their life. You can't do that. At some point, they're going to have to be responsible for their own decisions. And, and when it blows up, what do you do? Let them know, I love you. You know, you're, you're well, I love you and you have a place here, but... This blew up because, you know, you just let them know that had you, you know, we wish you had listened to counsel. Um, and so the, the Hebrew word for parents is horim. And it comes from the same root as the word teacher, which is more. Uh, and so what is a parent? A teacher, you know, it's a teacher. And that's why it doesn't take a village because there are some village idiots that I don't, I didn't want teaching my kids and I, or my grandkids. You know, that's a parent's responsibility. And um, I was a question was raised today uh, on my Facebook page. What do you, what do what do children do who have wicked, lawless parents? Are they supposed to obey wicked, lawless parents? And my answer was, yes. Until the instructions of those parents violate God's word. Yes, they are obligated to obey their mom and dad. Even though if those, if those parents are lost as a ball in high grass, they are to obey as long as there is no conflict of, you know, what the Scripture teaches. It's just like us. Do you think that there are some politicians that have passed laws that are wicked and vile and lawless and thieves and all this kind of stuff? Absolutely. Uh, now, we obey laws every day that have been passed on to us by some pretty wicked people. I can obey those laws as long as there's no conflict. Now, if there is a conflict between the law of the United States and the law of God, obey God rather than men. All right? And that, that's just the rule. All right? So, correction is an expression of love. Now, there is... God has designed a part of the anatomy... To spank a child. And we'll, probably all of us have been spanked before. And now there's a difference. And I've had people say, oh, you mean you you for abusing a child? I said, no, I didn't say I was for abusing a child. I said I'm for spanking a child. There's a huge difference between spank and abuse. Okay? And I think there are times when a child needs to feel some physical pain. And you know, we, we took the girls when they were little bitty things through the house 
and took them on a tour. And I would say, no, no, no. You know, it'd be a, a glass vase or something. And they'd reach to touch it. And I'd say, no, no, no. Not, it, not everything was no, no, no. There were some yes things. There were some toys. You know, we'd, we'd maybe put stuff out and let them touch it. And, and then they got to the point where they would self-correct themselves. They would see the glass face and go, no, no, no. You know, and I'd clap, and yes. Yeah, and I, yeah, no, 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 that's not what I meant. Uh, but, you know, kids just need to be taught. Um, and, and when your kids go to somebody else's house, those people ought not have to hide everything. You know, leave it there. Do you teach your kids, you know, how to respect the property of others. All right, look at verse number 25. The righteous eateth to the satisfying of his soul, but the belly of the wicked shall want. Verse number 25, evil empties the stomach. Now here's a choice. Be blessed with your needs provided or cursed with your needs persistent. Um, being saved is not a guarantee that your needs are going to be met. Have y'all y'all noticed that? Uh, but the godly man is just, he's more than just saved. The godly man is faithful to his commitment to the word and favor is attracted to the righteous favor gravitates to a righteous man cursing is attracted to an evil man i mean have y'all seen that's the way life works uh, I, i'm everybody in here has an example or maybe more of just a, an ignorant lawbreaker that has no regard for right and wrong and their life is just a constant train wreck constant train wreck and then there are people that you know they're saved and they love the lord and and they walk in principles of godliness and honesty and they have a good name they have good reputation people respect them people honor them and that's this is just the way god works in life and the book of proverbs is not uh, it is not spiritual algebra. It is not, if you do this, it always works out like this. It does not. These are general principles that this is the way life tends to work. All right? Because probably everybody in here knows some good, godly families that kids are, their kids turn out to be hellions. Uh, and so there's no guarantee. But what is a guarantee if you don't raise them according to the principles of the Bible? What is the guarantee for that? You know, yeah, you have problems for sure. All right, it's 8 o'clock. Time to go to the house. Thank you all for being here tonight. I appreciate it. Um, now, Sunday morning, ladies, we are going to honor and recognize you. We're going to be talking about you. And so uh, hope you'll be here. Anybody going to be, uh, you're going to be gone Sunday morning. We're going to be up in Georgia visiting your mama. And uh, so I don't know who all is going to come to, to be with their kids Sunday morning, but I'm looking forward to, uh, to the service. Y'all ready to go to the house? You tired? Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, let's pray. We'll be gone. Lord, we love you. Thank you so much. For the book of Proverbs and it's it's simple profundity. We love you and we praise you. Thank you for loving us enough give it, to give us guideposts and boundaries and borders in life to keep us safe. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.